morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Evan Carl. I'm the Senior Capacity Building Manager here at NYC Service. Uh, we are a division of the Office of the Mayor uh, that's really uh, all about promoting volunteerism, uh, engaging New Yorkers in service, uh, and trying to help organizations, city agencies, and other volunteer collectives build volunteer capacity and mobilize the power of everyday residents and service year members to impact New York City's greatest needs. Uh, I do wanna welcome you all to the third installment of our three-part workshop series, uh, Maximizing Impact Through Collaboration and Community Partnership. Uh, this session will focus on increasing your capacity for impact uh, through volunteer engagement. Uh, and so we are incredibly happy uh, to have you all on with us today. Um, before we sort of jump into the presentation, I do want to just give a couple quick announcements. Uh, first, uh, as you might already uh, be able to see, we are very proud to have ASL and closed captioning services uh, available to our attendees today. Uh, we have assigned two ASL interpreters for today's events. Uh, event, their name is Natalie Claren uh, and Beth Stale. Uh, these interpreters will be spotlighting themselves uh, to ensure a seamless transition uh, and high quality service uh, throughout the course of the presentation. So please feel free to utilize um, uh, their interpretation services if that would benefit you. Uh, we also offer uh, captioning services uh, and attendees will be able to click, uh, there should be a CC button at the bottom of the screen uh, that you can click on if you would like to see real time uh, subtitles. Uh, other than that, I did mention this sort of at the top of the presentation. Um, uh, but we will, uh, uh, well, hopefully we will be recording um, today's presentation uh, for posting on our website. Um, if you would like to uh, review the presentation uh, afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, and then finally, the last piece I'll just say is that uh, we will be engaging in breakout groups uh, over the course of the presentation. Uh, and just in order to facilitate that process, it would be incredibly helpful if we knew what organization you were a part of. So we do ask that all uh, attendees uh, today, do update their display name. You can do that relatively easily. Uh, you can just click the three buttons uh, next to your picture, click the rename dropdown, uh, and you'll be able to insert your organization name uh, after your display name. Uh, and I think that's it for now. Uh, I again just want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it off uh, to our presenter today, uh, Mita. Go ahead, Mita. Hi everyone, um, great to be with all of you this morning. Um, I see some familiar faces and names from our last two sessions over the past couple of weeks. Um, so great to see some of you again. And for those that um, this is their first session in the series, uh, welcome, uh, excited to, um, to dig into this with all of you. Um, so just kind of, I'll do a very quick introduction, but uh, I'm Amita Nagaraja, and I've been working with NYC Service um, on uh, a few programs over the past few years. Um, my background is primarily in corporate philanthropy, um, both grant making as well as um, employee volunteer engagement. Um, so I have, you know, maybe worked with a number of your organizations over the years. Um, and I currently um, consult still to the corporate sector, but also to um, the nonprofit sector on program design, strategy, um, coaching, training, strategic planning, um, a number of different areas. Uh, but um, volunteerism is definitely something that I've been really steeped in for many years um, and, you know, love sort of digging into. And I know that you know, it's evolved a lot over the past couple of years for all of us. So um, I also, you know, want to make sure that we have opportunities both during the breakout and also if you have things to add during the chat, you know, please do so during the chat. I think we all have a wealth of knowledge in this room. Um, you know, I have some things to share, but I think you, you all probably have a ton of experience and wisdom, um, you know, just given all that you're doing. So, you know, please uh, chime in. If you have something to add um, to what I'm talking about, please chime in in the chat and um, definitely share with your uh, colleagues when we get into our breakout rooms. Um, great. So today's uh, session um, are, you know, again, I think Evan has mentioned, um, is sort of, you know, aligned with our toolkit um, that we just put out. Uh, 
And so overall, we're talking about providing community organizations with tools and resources to help really sort of amplify their impact um, in the community. And today specifically, um, last session, we talked about um, how partnerships can help us build our capacity. And today we're really gonna be focus focusing on how volunteers can help us build our capacity um, and do more and really be more effective, more efficient and you know, serve our community sort of um, at a higher level. So we're gonna talk about sort of managing volunteers and really setting them up for success. You'll hear me probably say that a couple of times during this training. Um, and it was, you know, uh, there's some concepts, you know, that I've, that I've come across over the past couple of years that have really been eye-opening for me, you know, and one of them was this idea of, you know, when you hire an employee and bring them on board, um, would you do that? And, you know, have somebody show up without a role description, without clear direction as to what they need to do, without a place to sit, you know, and expect them to sort of blow you away with their work? Probably not. You know, when we're thinking about an employee and we're thinking about, you know, a salaried person who we're putting resources into, we want to make sure that they are really set up for success and able to do what we hired them to do. And volunteers just aren't that different. You know, they are unpaid, you know, um, resources, but they're still people and they still need sort of, you know, all of the tools and training and, you know, support um, in order to really do their best for your organization. So we're really going to be talking today about how to set our volunteers up for success and make sure that they're able to help us sort of deliver on, you know, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about various components of volunteerism, onboarding, management, you know, coordination, um, all of it. So look forward to diving in. So here are some of the key takeaways from our session, which we'll go through um, as we, as we, uh, as we progress. Um, and we'll also highlight a couple of tools that are in the toolkit. And we'll give, you know, we'll have an opportunity during our breakout um, to sample a part of one of the tools. Um, but, you know, all of this is obviously just, you know, where it's the tip of the iceberg. We very much hope that you'll take, um, you know, the learnings from today's session, as well as the full toolkit back to your organizations. And, you know, they're meant to really work organizationally with your colleagues and sort of, you know, go through the exercises, go through the reflections, use the tools in the toolkit to help you really build sort of the programs that you want to build. So engaging volunteers, you know, what are, what are some of the reasons that, you know, we're looking to engage volunteers? If we, you know, really sort of thoughtfully manage our volunteers, they have a lot of potential. They have potential to increase our organization's capacity and our impact. We have the ability to help our organization sort of better meet its goals. Um, volunteers can also serve as ambassadors sort of out in the world to help increase our organization's visibility and our organization's networks. And if given the right tools and, you know, after having developed the right relationship with volunteers, they really have the ability to potentially lead and innovate for your organization. Um, so those are just, you know, some of the things that we can benefit from, you know, if we really sort of thoughtfully manage our volunteers. And there's probably a lot more. So one of the things we're going to start talking about are designing our volunteer projects with purpose and really being thoughtful about how we do that. So we're going to go back a little bit to, to session one, something we talked about in session one, um, is assessing our organization's needs. So, you know, if, if those of you that were with us in session one, you'll recall, we spent a lot of time talking about community needs and organizational needs. So once you have a really good sense of what you're trying to accomplish in the community, what needs you're trying to address, you know, we asked you to reflect on what your organizational needs on, are. So when we're thinking about volunteerism and volunteer engagement, that's really critical to think about now, you know, with the community needs in the backdrop, what are our really critical organizational needs? What are our goals? Refer back to sort of some of that mapping that we did early in the toolkit that you'll find where we're looking at what those needs are, what our strengths are, where there are some cracks and gaps and where we might be able to use help. So once we do that and we have sort of a good sense of what that looks like, we need to think about what needs make sense to address with volunteer support. 
there's going to be some needs and gaps that you identify in your organization that it's just not realistic. I mean, you know, if we're being realistic, not every single thing can be addressed with volunteers. There are some things that just don't make sense for that, you know, that you really need staff or you need other types of resources. So going through those needs and really looking closely to see which are the ones that make sense to address with volunteer support. What are the things that are urgent and could really benefit from a volunteer? What opportunities are the type that'll help build organizational capacity and add value to your organization? And what's really feasible, you know, for your organization in terms of, you know, vo volunteerism is an incredible resource, but it's also a big responsibility to take on for an organization. It's a lot of work, you know, we're, we're not going to lie. I think anybody that's managed volunteers and, and done it in a way that it's really effective, it absolutely is going to take effort and work. So thinking about it for your organization, what are the what's feasible for you to take on in terms of planning, in terms of coordination, in terms of managing the volunteers on an ongoing basis? Um, you also need to be realistic about that. So thinking about all of those things. So we're just going to take a minute, you know, just just while we're talking about it, just for everybody to reflect on what is one gap or need at your organization. Um, that you could potentially address with the support of volunteers. So if you were with us in session one and you sort of did a little bit of that thinking around gaps and needs at your organization, or you've done that recently through other conversations at your organization, sort of, you know, run through that list in your mind. What's one that kind of jumps out that could be addressed by a volunteer or a group of volunteers? Feel free to come off um, mute to share if you want to share sort of what you're thinking, or feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, this is Susanna at Snow Harbor. I think one of our biggest challenges is we have 83 acres and we have um, dozens of renters and museums here on the site and programs that happen all throughout. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is people feeling lost when they arrive, not knowing where to go and how to get there. But, uh, and it would be wonderful to work with volunteers. I think the ongoing issue with management would be making sure that they understand who is where and what they do. And and that's always shifting all the time. And then on top of that, another thing is it can be really boring because there can be entire stretches of time where people might not be here on site. We have about 500,000 people a year, but that doesn't mean that we have a lot of activity. So we haven't moved into asking for volunteer support here because we've been concerned about bringing people in and having them be bored. And then also it just being a continuous process of informing them about what's happening on the site, being something that would need a weekly rundown with volunteers. And we're not sure that the reward would be sufficient. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. It seems like, it seems like you do have some sort of challenges and potential barriers, but I think the fact that you're raising these questions and starting to think about them is a great first step. To figuring out how to make it work. And sometimes the answer might be, you know, this, this, this exact sort of scenario may not work, but, you know, just having that conversation internally as an organization is a really critical first step. Anyone else have a need or a, um, something that they've surfaced? I'm taking a peek. Um, Bill from uh, Green Thumb shares that um, they always need help with physical space and gardens, but they also want to get residents into the gardens to become potential members, um, which is great. And sometimes, you know, uh, having volunteers can serve sort of two tracks. I mean, you know, it is sort of, you know, bringing more visibility to your organization, opening up the doors to sort of invite the community in. Um, and making sort of a group of volunteers feel like they're really part of an organization and going out and then being ambassadors for your organization. So there are potential sort of, there's the direct benefits of having volunteers, and then sometimes there's indirect benefits as well. Do we have one more person that wants to share? Yeah, I would like to share my mic, it's good. Sometimes goggle with my internet. Yes, I'm struggling to hear you. Do you want to maybe pop it in the chat? I, I, I'm struggling to hear you. So if you cannot hear me clearly. I know. Unfortunately, we can't. Hear you. Uh, 
Um, okay. I think Delina's maybe trying to put something in the chat. But, um, okay, terrific. Um, Laura from New York Foundling says, um, it's hard to find uh, purposeful ways to engage volunteers because so much of their work is directly in the community and with high risk folks. Um, that is really hard. And often there are challenges and barriers to the ways we can engage volunteers. And it's really important, that's why, to reflect on what opportunities make sense for volunteers and, you know, which ones just may not be appropriate to sort of bring in people, you know, external to the organization. Um, but there might be other opportunities, if not direct contact with the clients you serve. You know, really thinking about it, there might be opportunities to do communications with those people. You know, is it phone calls? Is it reminders? Is it doing more administrative functions? Um, you know, those aren't, aren't always sort of the most glamorous volunteer roles, but if you really talk about sort of the impact and how it connects to direct impact, volunteers that are passionate about the work that you're doing can get really motivated to even do sort of the back end or the administrative type of work. Um, Kyleen talks about how their compost program has expanded to neighborhoods where English is not the first language. So it's a great opportunity to reach diverse communities, but it's hard for their workforce to connect with these residents. Um, translation. Translation is a really great sort of skills-based volunteer opportunity. And um, yeah, it, you can, it can be tricky, but I think, again, articulating sort of your need is, is really the first step to being able to find those volunteers. Um, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit going forward, how to kind of find those volunteers. Um, Delina says their volunteers are all over the place. There's not assigned tasks and they need better direction for what needs to be done. So we're definitely going to talk about that today, Delina, how it's really critical for volunteers to understand what their role is and what they're being asked to do. So let's actually move forward the slide. Um, so this is related, but you know, the third kind of key step to designing volunteer projects that are really impactful is thinking through logistics. Logistics can sort of make or break a volunteer project. You know, the, the, the ultimate sort of, you know, need being met and what we want our volunteers to do is really important, but logistics are just as important, especially when you're bringing in maybe a rotating sort of group of people that are outside your organization. We need it to be really easy, really clear for everybody that's involved. So some questions to really think about when you're thinking about these logistics. You know, is this a one-time engagement or is this an ongoing engagement? What is what is a potential schedule look like for a volunteer or a group of volunteers? And what makes sense for your organization? Again, so for each of these questions, you need to think about it from the volunteer's perspective and also from the organization's perspective. What's realistic for volunteers to commit to and what's realistic for your organization to manage and commit to? So who's your target audience? thinking about what skills, experience, interests you'd like to sort of really target. So, you know, in the case of Kyleen, you know, you're targeting people with translation skills, with the ability to sort of, you know, be fluent in multiple languages and maybe even have the experience being a translator. Um, thinking really about what it is that you need. And sometimes it's not a hard skill. Sometimes it's, you know, somebody who's got, you know, the ability to sort of lift heavy equipment or somebody that's got the interest in, you know, art because you want them to do art with, you know, young people at your organization, but really kind of trying to define what would make a great volunteer for that particular role. You also want to think about what kind of training your volunteers are going to need. Do you, is this an opportunity that somebody can just come in and, and get started on? Or will they need some information? Will they need some very specific sort of subject matter training? Will they need just an introduction? Are they working with a sensitive population and they need sort of a lot of information on how to effectively work with that population? You know, if somebody's raising their hand and they want to volunteer with your organization, they want to feel good about their experience. And it's hard to do that if they don't have sort of the knowledge and the skills that they need. So you want to really identify that. Again, how can we set our volunteer up for success? What kind of training do they need? What kind of background information do they need? And then you really want to think about managing volunteers from the organization side. What kind of skills and experience does a volunteer manager in your organization need? Does that person need to be trained up? 
you know, it's, I think a lot of us are operating on the fly and sometimes it's just, hey, you know, your role is now to manage these volunteers. And that's great. Sometimes we do need to do things in a pinch and kind of figure it out. But when we have the luxury of planning time, that's another piece we want to think about. How do we equip our staff to set these volunteers up for success? Do they have the information they need? Do they know how to manage volunteers? Have they ever done it before? You know, it may seem obvious to those of us who have been managing volunteers for years, but if you've never done it before, that staff member might need a little bit of an orientation. They might need a reminder that when somebody walks in the door, you need to let them know the mission of the organization. You need to let them know where the restroom is. You need to let them know, you know, you need to give them a little bit of an orientation. So making sure your staff who are interacting with volunteers feel really equipped and have a sense of what to do. Um, you also want to think about what materials and supplies and tools you need for a specific volunteer activity. It could be technology. It could be actual sort of, you know, paint brushes and paints, you know, just really thinking about what is needed. So when somebody walks in the door and is taking their own time to work for your organization, you know, you're ready to go. You're able to give them what they need to get started. Um, you also want to think about space requirements and availability. If you're bringing in a skills-based volunteer, do they need office space? Do they need you know, a place to sit. Um, maybe that space is only available every Tuesday and Thursday because you have a staff member that comes in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that's something to keep in mind when you're creating a schedule. We only have a space for that person on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's important to sort of, you know, realize that and kind of articulate that. And then you also want to think about a budget. If, if, if it's a volunteer activity that requires some sort of a budget, you want to really be clear on that from the start. Um, and if you're looking, you know, it could be a budget to actually execute the project. It could be a budget for recruiting for volunteers, for refreshments for volunteers, for tools and materials for volunteers. But you want to really sort of lay that out. And if you're looking for approval internally on those budgets, remember to sort of, you know, be very clear about the value that volunteers are bringing back to your organization. And if you're able to really quantify that, it can be really helpful with getting budgets approved internally if you need a small budget to engage your volunteers. So our next step coming directly out of kind of reflecting on all of those questions is developing a really clear volunteer role description. And this is very critical. It's important for your organization because you want to make sure that your organization is you know, very clear on what a volunteer is doing, but you also want to make sure that when you're sending it out to potential volunteers, they understand exactly what they're signing up for. You're going to have a much happier volunteer if they know what they're signing up for, show up, and that's what it is, than somebody who, you know, thinks they're signing up for one thing and show up and realize, you know, the set of responsibilities is completely different, or they're not, you know, they're not sort of experienced for it. So you want to make sure a good volunteer role description is not super long, but it's very clear. It has all of the basic information. It has what the role and responsibilities are, what the timeline is. Is this a one-time project? Is this a weekly project, you know, forever, however long somebody wants to do it? Is it, does it have a three-month time frame? You know, reflecting on that a little bit. Um, what are the required skills and experience that are needed? And what are kind of the basic expectations of the role? Um, you want to make the description compelling. Really important, you know, to, to sort of mention in there what the impact is and how this connects to the organization's mission. If a volunteer has, has found you, but whether by looking on your website, by connecting through another organization, they feel connected to your organization in some way. They're coming to you for a reason. You want to be able to, you know, if, if, if the job, the volunteer job is stuffing envelopes, you know, there's a big difference between saying, you know, the role is stuffing envelopes. Let us know if you're interested. And, you know, versus saying the role is stuffing envelopes for our number one fundraiser of the year that helps us resource the incredible work that we do for, you know, clients in this community. It helps us pay for, you know, X, Y, and Z. And without this fundraiser, our organization would not be able to offer these services. And you can be a part of it by helping us stuff envelopes. You know, that's, that's much more compelling. It's something somebody can connect to and say, all right, well, you know, I'd like to help do that. That's something that I have the skills to do. And I've got some time and may not be, you know, the most glamorous job, but wow, it's important. It's going to do something for this organization. So the way you sort of really frame that is important. 
Um, and just side note, every volunteer role that you are sort of creating at your organization should be connected to helping your organization meet its goal. If you, if you can't find that one liner that explains why this volunteer role connects to your mission, then you probably shouldn't focus on that volunteer role. You probably shouldn't be putting resources into that. Every volunteer role should in some way sort of connect to the mission of your organization and help you move that forward. Um, you also may want to include sort of the benefits to the volunteer. This is a great way to sort of make your pitch, you know, to the volunteers. Talk about the development opportunities that they might get you know, from doing this volunteer opportunity? Are there any skills they'll develop? Is there a potential leadership they might develop? Are there any benefits that your um, organization offers, like transportation or refreshments? Mention those things in there. It might make, you know, might remove a barrier for a volunteer if your organization provides Metro cards to volunteers to get there. That might be the difference between somebody saying, I can do that, or, you know, I don't know if I'm, I'm able to do that. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I can't pay for that Metro card, but you know, if it's paid for, I, I can volunteer for this. I want to do this. So, you know, be as clear as you can sort of in that role description. Um, and Bill brings up a good point about waivers, um, you know, in case there are things that have liability issues attached. So those are things that are really important to sort of reflect on and also put into the role description. If it's something that you want people to be aware of before they walk in the door. Um, or at the very least, build into kind of your orientation and your onboarding to make sure that people are, you know, just well aware sort of, you know, of any, any risks they're taking on. And finally, you want to establish success metrics. You want to sort of think ahead a little bit and think about, you know, we want this volunteer engagement to be really successful and help our organization. And what, is, what does that look like? What is success going to look like? How will we know this volunteer opportunity is working? How will we know that we're getting what we need out of it? And if you do that early on, then it gives you this really, really great opportunity to build that evaluation right into the beginning of that opportunity. Am I going to check in with my volunteer, you know, every month to ask them, you know, a short set of questions about how it's going? Am I going to check in with my clients that my volunteers are working with to ask them how it's going? Are we going to every week sort of, you know, see how many packages we were able to distribute based on, you know, just bringing in volunteers to kind of do food packing. But thinking about what you're, what you're really aiming for to get out of, this, out of this opportunity and how you'll be able to track that. Because you want to know if it's successful and you want to know where you're making adjustments and tweaking. So again, your organization can continually sort of get really the value it's looking for from volunteers. And volunteers can sort of feel that satisfaction knowing that they're, you know, bringing value to the organization. So another piece that we touched on is this idea of reflecting on whether you're able to leverage volunteer skills and talents. Um, you know, there's sort of more conventional volunteer activities. And then I'm sure that, you know, most of you are familiar with skills-based volunteer activities, activities that really leverage volunteers' professional skills and talents to help address needs in your organization. These can often generate a lot of value for the organization, and they can also bring a lot of satisfaction to volunteers. Um, and when these are done really well and executed thoughtfully, they can turn into long-term relationships with volunteers that can bring you really valuable surface services over and over to your organization. Um, they do require careful planning and careful management in order to do it well. You're almost talking about an extension of really staff here. So thinking about, you know, what that person needs to bring to the table, how you'll manage these projects, how they'll sort of, you know, live in your organization. So there's a lot of planning and management that's required here. So some best practices for managing skills-based volunteers. Um, and some of these mirror the best practices about thinking through logistics for any type of volunteer opportunity. So, um, you know, first we wanna be really specific about what we're looking for, about the project parameters and the time commitment. I always say, you know, if you send out a blast to your existing network of volunteers saying, we need a graphic designer, you know, if you got that blast, you know, would you, would you reach back out to the organization and say, oh yeah, I'm a graphic designer. Like, you know, I want to help. You might, but you might also be a little nervous and say, well, what am I signing on for? Is this, am I signing on to be their graphic designer, like pro bono, you know, forever? Or, you know, what is it they're asking me to do here? 
But if you put out a description that said, you know, we're looking for a graphic designer to design materials for our gala that's coming up in May. And, you know, we expect that we're going to need, you know, about five hours a week of this person's time leading up to May. Does that feel like something that you're, you know, you would might be more willing to commit to? Okay, I know exactly what they're looking for. Their gala's in May. So I know that, you know, after that, you know, my commitment is over. I know exactly how many hours they're looking for leading up to May. I think I can do that. And you're also weeding out people that can't do that. You know, if you know, if you really get crystal clear on what it is that you need, you also will save your organization a lot of time responding to each person that reaches out and says, oh, actually, I'm going on vacation in April for a month, so I would not be a good fit for that. You know, you, you weed out people that wouldn't be a good fit, and you really sort of encourage people that are a good fit to reach out to you. So it saves your organization sort of time and resources, and it also is, is more appealing to a volunteer to sort of you know, move forward on something when they have a much clearer picture of what they're signing on for. You also want to make sure that you have a primary point of contact for a, a skills-based volunteer. Um, when somebody comes on board, let's say, to create an annual report for your organization, you know, we can't put it on the volunteer to sort of be calling around the organization for every piece of information and, you know, sort of scrambling to get everything they need to sort of meet those deadlines. We want to make sure there's a clear point of contact within the organization who's getting everything that person needs to them, who's going to help them, who's going to sort of be the coordinator, be their point person internally to get what they need, and be there to answer questions, you know, flag any concerns, all of that. You also want to set clear expectations for both the volunteer and the organization. So again, sort of time commitment, exactly what you're looking for from the volunteer. But you also want to get really clear if you are doing, let's say, a writing project or a graphic design project, you want to make sure that, you know, organizationally, the people that are working on it also understand that we want to be respectful of a volunteer's time. Maybe we want to say, you know, um, you know there'll be three sort of revisions on this particular project. That's how many revisions this volunteer is committing to. So they don't feel like they're going to be, you know, just revising, revising, revising a hundred times. You know, and on the flip side, to be respectful to the volunteer, it's really important that you sort of coordinate within the organization. You know, think about the experience from a volunteer side. If, you, if they've made three, four, or five revisions to something, and then you come back to them at the last minute and say, we just showed our executive director and, she, she doesn't like the entire direction this is taking. So we're going to have to rewrite big chunks of it and, you know, completely redesign it. You know, when you're talking about that would never fly with a paid resource that you're bringing on to do that for you. So you want to make sure that you're being really respectful of, you know, a volunteer resource also. You know, people have pride in their work. You want to make sure that you're coordinating and giving feedback in a coordinated way and, you know, early points throughout the process to be able to say, you know, yes, we're, we've, we're all signing off on this. Please continue in this direction. So thinking about just ways that you would work with a paid resource and how you might take that and work with your volunteer resource. Um, you might want to think about, if you have an opportunity, promoting it first to people that are already in your network, people that you're already volunteering, that are already volunteering with you. You may not know what skills and talents they have to offer, or if their best friend or their partner or, you know, their kid has that talent and already has somewhat of an emotional connection to the organization. Um, if you're new to skills-based volunteerism, I highly recommend that you start small that you not take on sort of, you know, huge projects that are kind of make or break for the organization or, you know, a huge endeavor. It's, it's something that you want to build that muscle at and get really good at and understand how to sort of approach it. So if you're just starting out, I recommend that you start small on a smaller project with a small team of volunteers or an individual volunteer to test it out, see how it feels for your organization, see what best practices you can create. You also want to make absolutely sure that you're inviting feedback from these volunteers. You want to make sure that they have a great experience because guess what? Then you might have a graphic designer that's willing to, you know, design your gala materials year after year after year. So being able to address some of their concerns, some of the ways they like to work, you know, again, it's, a, it's going to be a compromise, but, you know, thinking about how we structure it so it's a win-win. 
And you absolutely want to share the impact of that work with volunteers and with colleagues. Um, you want to share it with the volunteers that worked on it, but you also want to share it internally, especially if skills-based volunteerism is new to your organization. You want to be able to share it and be able to show other people that, you know, it can have a real impact and it can be something that's doable for your organization. And maybe that'll sort of, you know, address any fears that some people in your organization have about taking on skills-based volunteers. So share the wins with them. Share the wins back with your organizations to get people excited about trying it out for themselves. So one important tool that's in the toolkit here is this idea of sort of mapping the journey of a volunteer and really kind of breaking it up into its smallest pieces so you can really get a sense of the volunteer's experience, both from the volunteer's perspective as well as from the organization's perspective. So there's an exercise in, in the toolkit that we're gonna do a small part of here. Um, and the goal of it is to really break it down into those small parts so you can take a look at it and see where you could make it better, where you could make the volunteer experience a bit better for the volunteer, where the clunky parts are for your organization. Maybe bringing on volunteers within your organization is a, is a really tedious paper process and somebody has to go through a ton of paper applications and call each volunteer and you know, explain to them exactly what they'd be coming on board for and then bring them into to, to interview. And you know, maybe it's a really complex opportunity. So of the 20 people you interview, only five of them you know, actually make you know, a, a really good fit. So think about what's clunky on the organizational side and what's kind of a struggle on the volunteer side. And looking at that and figuring out where you can sort of really tweak the volunteer experience to make it better. So let's go to the next slide and just give you a little snip, you know, snippet of it. Um, so what we what we ask you to do in this in this exercise is in the organization section, listing the organization's role at each stage of a volunteer's journey, and potential opportunities and challenges your staff might encounter. And step one, which I guess we I skipped, but um, step one is doing that for the volunteer side. What does recruitment feel like for the volunteer? And what does it look like on the part of the organization? What does the onboarding and orientation look like for the volunteer? And what does it look like for the organization? So the point is to really surface some of the weak spots in this process and figure out where we can really, again, set our volunteers up for success and where organizationally we can make this feasible for us as an organization. So we're not going to have to the time to do sort of the full volunteer journey um, here today. But if we go to the next slide, I'm going to ask everyone to just think about the first day for a volunteer at your organization. And if you have a variety of different types of volunteers working on different programs, I'm going to ask you to think about one specific type of volunteer. Is it the, you know, food packing volunteer? Is it the art therapy volunteer? Is it the skills-based, you know, volunteer who is, um, you know, doing uh, some type of service for your organization? So think just for a moment right now about a specific type of volunteer, a specific bucket of volunteers at your organization. And then I want you to think specifically about their first day at the organization, whether is that the orientation for your organization? Is there an, a volunteer orientation? Or do they just show up and the orientation happens on day one as part of their first volunteer experience? Just think about what day one looks like for that person with your organization. And I'd like everyone to take just a couple of minutes to sort of jot down a couple of notes and reflect on what that first day looks like. And we're going to focus just on the volunteer perspective for this. But in the exercise, you'll want to focus on, you know, when you do it back at your organization, you want to focus on both pieces, what the volunteer experience is and what the organization has to do for that step for the volunteer. But for today, just in the interest of time, we're going to think about a volunteer's perspective on the first day. So jot down a couple of notes on what that looks like for that specific type of volunteer. And think about what's working really well and what's, you know, may not feel great for the volunteer. Um, 
So we're going to give you guys a couple of minutes to do that. And then we're going to put you in breakout rooms to talk a little bit about what that looks like and what some of your kind of aha moments were and where might you be able to make a tweak, a small tweak. Sometimes the tweaks are really small that can be really, really meaningful. Sometimes things require a huge adjustment. And sometimes, I mean, I've worked with organizations where, you know, the struggle was really around just, you know, how do we recognize volunteers and how do we make sure leadership sees all the incredible work volunteers are doing? And there were a lot of answers to that question, but one of the answers was just give volunteers a t-shirt, like a bright colored t-shirt. So they stand out when people look around the organization and we see who they are, what they're doing, the difference they're making. And leadership and board members can walk around and just notice and recognize the, the impact that volunteers are having. They just kind of stand out and jump out at you. That wasn't the full solution, but it was one small tweak that made a really big difference in that organization. So thinking about what are, you know, one or two small tweaks or big tweaks that you want to make based on reflecting. And if you're reflecting and saying, wow, we do this really, really well, then think about why, why it's going really, really well, and how you might want to take that and extend that to other parts of the volunteer experience and share why it's going really well with your breakout room, because you can all learn from each other during this experience also. Um, and we want to hear about what everybody's doing well, so we can, you know, benefit from that. Other organizations can benefit from that. So we'll give everybody a couple of minutes um, and then we're gonna put you in breakout rooms. And if you are in a breakout room with your own organizational colleagues, it's an opportunity to really talk about that and dig in together and, and think about it and reflect on it and work a little bit on it. We'll give everyone another few seconds to just join us. Um, I had the chance to jump in a couple of different rooms and seemed like people were actively chatting. Um, and I was in breakout uh, four, and we had a really good conversation. One, um, one point that I want to pull out of there was, you know, we talked about how, especially on day one, um, it's important to think about why those volunteers are in the room and really try to kind of help address, you know, the different reasons they're there volunteering at your organization. You know, they want to, you know, feel good about the work that they're doing. So we want to be able to, you know, talk about the impact of their work. But they might also be there to meet people, to network. So, you know, the orientation could serve a couple different purposes. It might not just be about, you know, sharing information about, you know, how to volunteer, what they need to do, what kind of information they need. It might also be really important to make sure that volunteers get to hear from each other and connect with each other. So thinking about what the volunteer value proposition is, we know why we're bringing volunteers to our organization. Hopefully we're really clear on that after we've gone through this process, but also sort of putting on the hat of the volunteer and thinking, why is the volunteer here? What might volunteers be looking to get from my from this experience? And you know, you may not be able to deliver on every single one, but but thinking about it and thinking about how you want to design, you know, the experiences based on that. So you want to make sure they get a chance to network. You want to make sure they understand the impact so they can feel good about that. You want to, you know, maybe they came on board because they want to build some additional skills. And if that's what you told them, you know, they were able to do through this opportunity, you want to be able to deliver on that. So, you know, just thinking about what, what their rationale is for being there and trying to um, design the experience, you know, to meet some of those needs. Um, is there one person that we could uh, we could hear from just to hear, um, you know, any sort of learnings or, or ideas that came out of their breakout room? If anybody wants to share, they can come off mute and share something. Um, my name is Valentina Jones and I'm from the Lower East Side Power Partnership. And one of the things uh, I shared with the group was the fact that we've had to like rethink uh, what we're doing because of this pandemic. So that uh, some of the ways that we did things before uh, in person, et cetera, are not, uh, and some of, yeah, that is, it's not practical at this time. And at this time, it's really where we have to rethink and think about the fact that most meetings and a lot of things are gonna be in a hybrid model, that that's how people are gonna be comfortable uh, is offering a hybrid model. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's really important to reflect on. And, you know, a lot of us were thrown into that over the past two years. Um, but, you know, the, the world that we're kind of going into um, is hopefully going to open up a little bit, but it's likely that things will remain in a bit of a hybrid model. So um, now we have a chance to plan for that. What does that look like? Really important when thinking about the volunteer experience and kind of how your organization kind of, you know, sort of you know, is going to to handle each each piece of that volunteer experience. How are we going to do that well in a hybrid model? You know, we have a chance to think about it and design it right now. So what does that look like? And we're actually going to spend, I have a slide, um, you know, as we keep moving here, specifically on best practices for virtual engagement. Um, I think Bill has a hand up. Did you have a question, Bill? Yeah, I tell just a comment. I'll be real quick because yeah. you're going to address it. But uh, although none of us knew what Zoom was, it didn't even exist. Uh, I have to say that going forward, I hope, for example, the city keeps us funding this because it's a very handy. It's a lot more convenient sometimes for a lot of meetings rather than having to get out and go and in our case, you know, what if it's raining, et cetera. So there are actually advantages to having a, a you know, this kind of a format in some instances. Absolutely. No, it's a really good point. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of organizations experienced that, you know, the last couple of years was really tough, but I know a lot of organizations were able to expand their volunteer base. You know, all of a sudden they had people from even outside of New York City or from further parts and further boroughs that were able to, you know, engage and get involved in different ways. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think thinking about that um, and, and keeping some of the things that are working for our organization that we had to develop during pandemic, but it doesn't mean we have to get rid of them. You know, if, we, if things start opening up in the coming months, maybe there are certain aspects that we'd like to hold on to that are working for our volunteers, working for our organization. Um, great, let's uh, jump forward. So recruiting volunteers, thinking about, you know, now that we've reflected on kind of, you know, what types of volunteers we want to bring on, creating role descriptions, doing a lot of that work, thinking about how we bring on volunteers, where do we find the volunteers that we need? We want to make sure that we look within our own communities to kind of really find kind of some of those untapped resources. You know, who are the people that we might be able to connect with that are right here? Um, we want to tailor kind of our recruiting to be able to you know, raise awareness and interest in volunteerism, you know, within our, with our organization. Um, you also want to think about volunteers' professional backgrounds and what their motivations are for volunteers, as well as some obstacles to volunteering. So we just talked about that, you know, maybe traveling great distances is really tricky for some people. So are there things, are there needs that your organization has that could be met virtually? Is that possible? And might you be able to tap into like a very specific group of volunteers if you continue offering those virtual opportunities? Because there are some people that can't travel or, you know, think about the other obstacles that people might be experiencing. Um, and again, I mean, I don't think we can say this, you know, we can keep saying this over and over because it's so important, but communicating clearly about the role and all expectations that you have is kind of your best tool for recruiting. Um, so a couple of kind of best practices, ensuring that your information is accessible. You want people to be able to find you if you've got some great opportunities. So, you know, what are the best networks to, you know, to do that? Is there a newsletter in your sort of space? Is there, you know, do you have an idealist post? Um, you know, are, is the information clearly available on your website? Making sure that kind of people can find you. If they're interested in what your organization focuses on and they're interested in volunteering, what are the different ways people will be trying to find you and will your information be there? Um, engaging community stakeholders to help get the word out. You know, in session one, or for those of you that weren't there early in the toolkit, we mapped community stakeholders. Who are they? Who are the people that, you know, can help us get the word out? Who know people that might, you know, you know be interested in the kinds of things that we're doing? And don't take, you know, don't sort of sell your current network short. Your current network is probably the best way to get the word out there. People that already care about your organization, care about the work that you're doing. They may want to tell their friends. They may want to tell their families. They may want to post it on different boards that they have access to. So letting your current volunteers and current sort of networks and supporters know about these opportunities is probably, you know, I would say the single best way to get the word out there. 
Um, and then identifying other networks and coordinating with them to help promote your volunteer opportunities. Those partners that we talked about in session two, who are your partners? You know, maybe they have access to additional networks, you know, that are kind of overlapping, that also might have people that care about the work that you're doing. Um, you know, and your first sort of engagement with a volunteer, a potential volunteer, you want to make sure it's a really positive experience. You want to keep volunteer intake brief and simple. So people, you know, they've got that volunteer role description that's hopefully simple and clear and has all of the information they want. And once they come to you, if the next step is and fill out a 100 page application, that's going to be a barrier. That's going to be tricky. You know, you might lose people, lose potential great volunteers there. So think about it. Is your process for volunteers to express an interest, is it clunky? Is it difficult? Is it super time consuming? Or is it pretty simple? You know, you need, you need some information. You want people to want to invest a little bit of time, but you want to keep it fairly streamlined. So thinking about what that first sort of contact is with a volunteer and making sure it's positive, it has the information they need, and it's, you know, fairly simple process. Some resources that you might want to tap into, NYC Service, of course, um, you know, can help think about ways to kind of get the word out and help you recruit volunteers. Idealist, of course, is out there. There's a couple of different sites in New York City. New York Cares is certainly one of the opportunities. Um, but thinking about, you know, and there's obviously a lot more than this also. So thinking about based on the types of opportunities you have, the space that you're in, what are, what are the resources? You might live in a very, or your organization might be serving a really, really vibrant community, which has really active sort of mutual aid networks and maybe newsletters. I mean, maybe there's, you know, sort of gathering spaces and community spaces where even just an old school flyer, you know, might be really, really sort of useful in getting the word out. So just really reflecting and thinking about, you know, who you're looking for and how you might get to them. Um, you know, those that were looking for very special skills for skills based opportunities, you might want to connect with schools or graduate programs or, you know, different types of, um, you know, entities that are helping train people in that it might be a win win, they might be able to get experience and you might be able to get people with those skills. Um, so thinking really just reflecting on what are good places to sort of recruit from that help meet your needs. So setting your volunteers up for success, um, you know, if we sort of think about what some of our best practices are to managing our staff and how we dedicate our time and resources to managing volunteers, then we have the potential to sort of engage volunteers, retain volunteers, increase our capacity, and build a really loyal base of ambassadors. So we went through that journey mapping exercise and we only looked at the very first piece of it. But I wanna talk a little bit about sort of onboarding volunteers, go into a little bit more depth around, you know, what happens after recruitment. We onboard volunteers and then we manage volunteers on an ongoing basis. And we're gonna talk, you know, a little bit about what, what some best practices are there. And I'm gonna invite everybody, you know, during this session to, to kind of weigh in on the chat because, you know, what I'm gonna talk through in the slides that I have around onboarding and managing are not, you know, that's not, it's not comprehensive. There's tons of best practices. There's tons of things that you can do to do these things well. So these are kind of some highlights. And I would love to hear if people wanna chime in on, you know, other best practices for onboarding and managing volunteers, please include those in the chat. Please feel really free to kind of just jump in there. So onboarding volunteers, everybody wants to feel kind of welcome when they arrive. They want to feel like, you know, they're, they're, that your organization is excited to have them there and they want to feel prepared. Nobody wants to show up to their first day of any type of job, whether it's a volunteer role or a paid role and feel like they don't know what they're doing. They don't have the skills and the tools that they need. So you really want to make sure that your organization is prepared for that. First impressions are important. And when new volunteers start with an organization, that experience really sets the tone for the relationship. So some best practices with onboarding volunteers. Having somebody block time on their calendar to welcome a new volunteer on their first day. 
you know, if it's a big group of volunteers, that's a one-time group, great. You know, have somebody go and greet them and, you know, tell them what they need, do kind of a mini orientation. But if it's somebody who's going to be with your organization on a regular basis, the person that's going to be managing them or supervising them, ideally, would put time on their calendar to sit with them, welcome them, explain what, you know, the organization does and what the expectations are. Um, you know, get to know new volunteers, just getting to know them a little bit, if they're going to be sort of a regular, you know, face at your organization, and making them feel like they're a part of the team, introducing them around to other volunteers, to key staff members that they might be working with, if they're volunteers that are there in person, giving them a mini tour, making sure that they know where to go for different things, making sure they know where the refreshments are, you know, coffee, tea, making sure they know where the restrooms are, just real basics, but things that make people feel like, okay, now I'm comfortable here. Um, orienting volunteers to their workspace, um, educating on organizational culture, letting them know either beforehand or when they arrive, you know, if it's a casual culture, you know, what, what can they wear? What can they, you know, where when they come to your organization, other things that they might want to know about your organizational culture. Um, reviewing the role description that hopefully they've seen when they've come on, but asking them if they have any questions, making sure that they understand kind of expectations and letting them know of any training that you're planning to offer, uh, other resources that they'll be given to help sort of set them up for success. And setting up regular check-ins making sure that you have an opportunity to kind of check in with them on a regular basis. For one, you know, for a one-time ongoing volunteer, this might look like a monthly kind of touch base or meeting. For a big group of volunteers that comes, you know, sort of ad hoc, that might be, you know, doing like a phone survey with three questions after their experience to get a sense if things went well that day. And if it didn't, you know, is there, you know, a line for comments where they could just say, you know, the materials weren't there. We ran out of X, you know, when we were packing this box. It's really good for your organization to know that, you know, things are going to happen. It's not going to be perfectly smooth, but making sure that you're setting up ways for them to give you feedback and also that you're responding to that feedback and saying, we'll be more prepared for that next time. Um, does anyone else have anything to chime in on the chat about onboarding volunteers? Anything that they want to you know, a couple of best practices or something that they do with their organization that you're really proud of, or, you know, something that's happened that hasn't gone so well that you really learned from. If you have anything, feel free to pop it in the chat. All right, I'm going to keep moving, but you can still uh, put it in the chat under sort of, you know, and tag it as kind of onboarding advice. Um, so managing volunteers uh, on an ongoing basis, you know, engaging volunteers and inspiring them to sort of make a longer commitment to your organization. Um, having return volunteers is one of the best ways to make volunteerism efficient for your organization and have it sort of add the most value back to your organization. Because, you know, recruiting new people, bringing on new people, training new people, that's, you know, that's all resources that your organization is putting into volunteerism. If you have people that are willing to make longer term commitments and come back to your organization repeatedly, it helps sort of, you know, really sort of bring value back to your organization and makes things, you know, so your, your organization doesn't have to have so much layers of management around this. So continuing that level of care, you know, hopefully you've onboarded your volunteers really thoughtfully, making sure that you continue to manage them sort of in a thoughtful way. So again, just a few key best practices for managing volunteers, providing clear direction, communicating regularly with your volunteer, and providing ongoing feedback to them and providing opportunities for them to give you feedback as well. Um, you know, it's hard to sort of give people constructive feedback. It's even harder if it's not, you know, part of the process. If you already have a weekly meeting set up and the goal of that meeting is to share feedback and hear feedback from your volunteer, it's a lot easier to sort of give them some direction or say, hey, I noticed you were doing this and I would, you know, I'd love to ask you to do this a little bit differently. But if that's not something that's regularly set up or talked about when they first come on, it's a little bit harder to figure out how to do that delicately. So setting up sort of that regular cadence of communication back and forth is going to really help in the long run. Making your volunteers a part of the team, 
um, on an ongoing basis, you know, find out, you know, what their birthday is of your volunteer or, you know, include them in big organizational announcements or, you know, if your organization is doing celebrations, you know, invite volunteers, you know, building trust with your volunteers, really listening to them and recognizing your volunteers. These are some of the things you can do sort of an on, on an ongoing basis to make volunteers feel like they're really connected to your organization. And Lillian, thank you for chiming in. Um, Lillian talks about making sure that you talk about the projects um, and the tasks and asking volunteers to sort of pick teams. So, you know, giving them some choice and letting them know the different opportunities that are available to them. Another thing that we can do to sort of, you know, continue building that connection is, is explicitly sort of, you know, making an effort to build community and connection with volunteers and among volunteer groups. So, you know, are there opportunities, especially if you're doing volunteer activities, whether they're virtual or in person, building moments of connection, doing a quick icebreaker, having people sort of share their names, you know, just to, to make sure that they know each other. You know, is it hosting a weekly or monthly happy hour or trivia night for volunteers where your organization gets to hang out with them, know them a little bit better, and they get to connect with each other? holding a virtual office hours. You know, maybe there's an hour a month where, you know, your volunteer management staff just says, we're gonna be on this Zoom, jump on. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear things that are working, that are not working, just chat with you. You know, we're, we welcome you to do that. Um, whether or not people take advantage of it, it probably really feels like somebody's reaching out and wanting to hear what they have to say. Um, creating channels for volunteers to connect with each other. Is it a Facebook page? Is it a Slack? Is it a WhatsApp? You know, figuring out what makes sense. Um, building awareness and educating volunteers on issues with guest speakers. You know, they're there because they care about the work your organization is doing. Maybe you have, you know, a quarterly guest speaker, um, you know, that's, that's on Zoom, that, you know, to come and share kind of something happening in your space. Maybe it's a senior leader from your organization. Um, all of these things make people feel like they're connected to the organization and feel appreciated. And celebrating and acknowledging volunteers however you can and asking volunteers to share stories about their experiences, whether it's on your social media, whether it goes into a newsletter. Um, it's a great way to sort of highlight volunteers and also, you know, allow them to share kind of the, you know, their, their opportunities and maybe, you know, convince others to, to try it out. The next one is kind of just some quick tips specifically on virtual volunteer engagement. So, you know, the reality is that virtual volunteer activities usually require the same level of planning and present preparation as an in-person activity. So knowing that going in, it's not like something that you can just phone in, which I'm sure a lot of you have learned over these past couple of years. But think about the level of effort required to implement a virtual initiative. Really important. If you have a partner or a corporate partner or a group of volunteers asking you to do something, make sure it is still meeting a critical need of your organization. You know, and maybe it's just networking. And if that's going to help you in terms of volunteer recognition or appreciation, that's great. But make sure it makes sense for your organizations to, to do because it is going to take resources and time to plan. So once you've decided on your virtual activity, keep some of these best practices in mind. Um, make sure you use the opportunity to communicate impact and educate volunteers. Limit the length. People only have so much sort of that they can do on, on a Zoom. So don't make these activities really long. I would say, you know, an hour max. So if they're doing something in breakouts and really working on something, maybe a bit longer. Um, establishing really clear communication channels. Figuring out ways to create community, even virtually, through icebreakers, trivia, you know, just things to get people to laugh and feel like they're maybe in the same room. Um, getting really comfortable with technology, making sure that you've done that in advance and, and you know how to run something so we're not spending a lot of time with sort of clunky technology, figuring it out with people on the line. Um, making sure to have the right person lead the activity, a good facilitator um, is really important when you're doing virtual. Um, and making sure that when you're thinking about it, you're thinking about both the substance of the activity and the technology and the format and how you run it. Both are equally important. And then celebrating and recognizing volunteers, of course, always, and any partner organizations. So some things to think about when you're putting on a virtual activity. 
So I know we're getting close to the end of our time. So I'm gonna go through these a little bit quickly. Um, for those of you that were on session two, some of the things around evaluation are, you know, a recap and similar to what we talked about for evaluation for, you know, when we partner with another organization. We wanna make sure to think about evaluation from the start. We wanna think about how you're gonna measure the success of your volunteer activities. You wanna be selective about what you measure, just like that 100 page sort of, you know, intake application, you wanna make sure you're not sending volunteers a hundred question survey because they're not gonna answer it. So really thinking about what you want to measure, what's most important and focusing in on that. Um, and measuring, in addition to measuring the impact of the activity, it's also really important to in some way measure volunteer engagement. Are they having fun? Are they getting out of it what they were looking to get out of it? Are they feeling the connection to that impact the organization is trying to have? Because that's really important to make sure that you are addressing some of that. Um, and surveying volunteers on the full experience from start to end. So not just how was today, you know, if it was a, a sort of an in-person activity, but also how was, you know, the onboarding piece? Did you get enough training? Did you, you know, get all the tools and materials that you needed? Making sure that you're, you know, understanding kind of their full experience. Um, and most importantly, any kind of evaluation is kind of pointless if we're not actually looking at the data and the feedback that we get back and reflecting on it and trying to make adjustments based on that. If it's all just sitting there, you know, on somebody's drive or, you know, in a stack somewhere, um, that feedback is not doing your organization any good. So making sure that it's really built in to kind of reflect on it and look at it periodically um, and actually actively make tweaks based on that. Um, a few just sample reflection questions when you're thinking about evaluating the volunteer experience. These will also be in the toolkit for your reference and everybody will also be getting the slide deck for your reference. So Megan, I'm so sorry that I'm giving you like a minute. <laughs> we, we, I guess we, uh, we delved into um, some of the stuff a little bit longer, but there is a section in the toolkit, a really important section on striving for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the work that we're doing, um, you know, as an organization and with our volunteers. Um, so I'll turn it over to Megan for a minute to kind of talk through this, um, or just at least share where you can get more of these resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, really quickly in the appendix of our toolkit, we do have an entire section on DEIA, uh, where we talk about um, a couple of suggestions and best practices, and also um, some foundational frameworks that people can um, look at and build off of. So thinking about, you know, does your organization outline diversity, equity, inclusion, and access as core values? Is it a part of your mission statement? Um, and do you include it in your volunteer process, um, either for recruitment, onboarding, retention, or anywhere in there? Um, I know that we all kind of want our organizations to be as responsive to the needs of our community as possible. And um, keeping DEIA front of mind um, in our volunteer recruitment process or even when identifying partnerships can help us accomplish that. Um, next slide. So um, yeah, we have a lot of foundational frameworks in the toolkit that you can um, reference and specific recommendations for making your volunteer program uh, more equitable. So for example, one of the things I would suggest is deprivileging volunteering. There's a couple you know, ways to do that. Um, you can provide Metro cards to volunteers um, for taking the time out of their day to come. Um, you can also consider providing things like childcare or meals uh, to folks um, if that's something that your organization has the capacity to do. Um, but yeah, so um, all, of, all of that is kind of a part of um, having continual engagement with your volunteers and being responsive to their needs as well, because you're, you know, asking for their time. And so it's something about thinking about how can we make sure that this is something that they're able to, like not just willing to and like interested in engaging with long term, but is this something that they can, that they have the capacity to do. Um, and so, yeah, just all that is to say, um, reference the appendix section of our toolkit. This is a lot of, you know, work that we're investing in. Um, but as people providing services to our community, we have a responsibility to undo some of the less successful or less diverse um, systems that we're used to working with. And with that, I'll pass it back to Anita. Thank you, Megan. 
Um, so just wrapping up with just this really critical piece of sharing your stories. Um, you know, when there's, you know, you're doing great work with your organization and doing great work with partners and volunteers, you want to be able to really share that out. And it amplifies the impact of your organization's work in so many ways. Externally, it helps build your visibility, potentially draw more support to your organization and maybe attract more funders. Um, and internally, you recognize your team, you recognize the work that your organization is doing, it contributes to your organizational culture, and it really helps with employee morale and retention to kind of celebrate the work that you're doing. Um, a few short best practices for telling sort of an effective story. Um, images, critical, using great images, so always take photos when you can at events. Um, Investing in, you know, training team members in order to doing that, you know, to be able to have images, write stories, great to build up that skill internally, that communication skill on your teams. Um, keeping stories short, people are busy, it's hard, you know, front load those stories with lots of key details so people can just, you know, get the point of it very quickly and walk away with kind of that basic information. Using quotes and testimonials so you really get a sense of people's stories, whether it's your volunteers, whether it's clients they're working with, community members, sometimes great to have staff and leadership quotes about the work volunteers are doing, which can feel really good for a volunteer. Um, leveraging social media. Um, using stories to kind of strengthen these partnerships, talk about other partners in your community, talk about the volunteers that you're working with, um, posting images in places where they'll be visible to key stakeholders. Are they in your annual report? Are they in, you know, on your web page? Where can you sort of, you know, highlight some of the wonderful work that you're doing through volunteers and through partnerships? And challenging yourself to tell at least one story a month um, and definitely not waiting until you change the world to tell a story. I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of us do that. Let's wait until this is completely finished and we can wrap it up with a bow and let's wait until we have every single piece of data. It's not necessary. You can tell sort of a story along the way. And, you know, it's really important to kind of share regularly so people feel connected to what's happening with your organization. Um, so really doing that because it can attract other volunteers and it can also really sort of help engage and recognize the volunteers that you have. Um, so that is our session. Thank you all so much. Sorry that we ran a couple of minutes over um, and thank you for sticking around. I think most of you did. Um, but it was, it was great to be with all of you today. We're really, really excited for you to have the toolkits in your hands and um, excited uh, to, um, you know, have, have done this series with all of you and given you a taste of it. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Evan, who I think is going to share some next steps. Yeah, thank you so much, Amita. Uh, and thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as especially those who stuck around uh, for the last five minutes. Uh, my only quick announcement is that at this point, uh, we are concluding the workshop series, Maximizing Impact. Uh, I just wanna say, uh, you know, I think this was a really incredible opportunity for organizations to learn a bit about volunteer management, community assessments, partnership building, uh, evaluation, and then sharing out your stories. If your organization is interested in really diving a little bit deeper into these issues, particularly as they pertain maybe to your organization in particular, uh, we right now are gonna be developing a series of consultation sessions. So those are gonna be one-on-one -on -one sessions where your organization can come in uh, and meet with Amita on an ongoing basis uh, over the course of the next four months or so. Uh, so I just ask that everybody sort of keep your eyes on your email. Uh, there will be a very, very short, hopefully no longer than five to 10 minute application uh, for organizations looking uh, forward and potentially interested uh, in taking advantage of that free opportunity. Uh, so incredibly excited just to announce that. Again, we'll be emailing you uh, shortly. Uh, I'm just gonna include my email address uh, in the chat right now. If anybody would like to get in touch with me, uh, we will be emailing everybody who attended these sessions. Uh, that being said, if you did not sign up through the Eventbrite, uh, just be sure to shoot me an email so we can make sure that you're included on any future communications. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank you all again for attending today. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you guys uh, in the consultation application uh, in the future. So thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you for your time today.